youth with disability are more likely to be marginalized than uh, other children. And there is a need to develop cross-sectoral plans to address the various facets of uh, exclusion caused by disability. Mm -hmm. She mentioned that some progress has taken place in few countries. She mentioned Italy, Finland, but the progress is not enough and we need to do more and uh, including in raising awareness among the private sector. She also mentioned that there is a need for a call to action and a global action plan. And she mentioned that UNESCO is dedicated to work on such a global action plan. She uh, mentioned two important milestones, next steps. First one will be the International Forum to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Salamanca Declaration, which will be also an occasion to launch the global action plan. And uh, the second one will be the World Conference on Special Needs Education. I'm not sure about the dates, but um, uh, another important milestone uh, will be the 2020 Global Monitoring Report, which actually was also outlined yesterday, which will focus on inclusion and education with a particular focus on disability. There is an online consultation which is open. So <clears throat> following the uh, opening session, we had an introduction of the objectives of the roundtable by Jim and Jennifer. There were a few uh, points that were raised, like uh, the fact that we need to look at inclusive education from a systemic perspective with a systemic lens, um, that the eight countries that are present in uh, this uh, roundtable are here not only to present their challenges, but also their promising practices. Uh, we need to uh, he raised, Jim also raised the importance to mainstream inclusive education in education sector planning and also mentioned the importance of the progressive realization of inclusive education and I will actually come back to that. Um, and finally, uh, he mentioned that one of the outcomes of the roundtable will be to design a training pro program on, on inclusive education for various audiences uh, depending on geographic locations and uh, linguistics uh, characteristics. He mentioned next year there will be a similar uh, roundtable for francophone uh, countries, if I'm not mistaken. So the second section uh, se uh, session was about education sector planning through an inclusive lens with two presentations by GPE and uh, 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 UNICEF, Natasha, and, uh, and the Paul, of, uh, Paul de Dakar, UNESCO. Uh, and here we have several discussion points. Um, we had three, three main discussion points. The first one was who owns the process of education sector analysis? Should education sector analysis be outsourced or carried out by government? What should be the balance between objectivity and ownership? The second point was how is the process of education sector analysis connected to other sector, education sector processes? such as the education sector planning. And the last one was what data to use and what to do with the lack of data. So the uh, responses to these uh, points during the discussion was that while governments usually request and lead the process of education sector analysis, it should be widened to a broader group of stakeholders to ensure ownership as well as credibility of the process. Some of the analysis and findings might not be appreciated by the government, but a strong basis on sound evidence will provide more objective perspective for policy decisions. Um, in, with regard to the connection uh, between ESA and other education processes, it was mentioned that often education sector analysis is connected with other processes and vice versa. In education sector planning, there might be situations whereby more in-depth information is needed. And at this point, education sector analysis could provide useful insights. Sometimes these processes could be carried out simultaneously, but this would require, of course, more time. And finally, about the lack of uh, data on how to use data, um, it, the discussion led to the fact that EMIS data is often unreliable or does not disaggregate uh, dis or the data are not disaggregated in terms of disability, for instance, on how a service might be integrated at the level of school. So various sets of data could be used in a complementary manner. Household surveys might complement administrative data. So um, 
we then moved to the first uh, panel um, session, which was about education sector analysis and education sector planning, uh, with two uh, countries represented, uh, Ghana and South Africa. So both countries, Ghana and South Africa, have an inclusive uh, education policy. And despite excellent uh, policies, both countries face major critical uh, major uh, critical implementation uh, gaps the south africa's policy reference both special uh, education and inclusion while ghana's policy reference mainstreaming of children with mild and moderate disabilities in regular schools so two different approaches ghana has recently complete, completed an education sector analysis uh, which was a response to the equity gap identified in the review of uh, the 2010-2020 Ghana, uh, Ghana's education sector plan. Um, the education sector analysis for inclusive education in Ghana was led by the Ministry of Education uh, with support from UNICEF. And the findings have been mainstreamed into the Ghana's education sector plans for 2018-2030. In South Africa, uh, there is a con con conducive legislat legislative environment to support implementation of inclusive education. However, implementation of inclusive education, especially in public schools, continue to be a challenge. Private schools tend to implement inclusive education, but at a, at a higher cost. In South Africa, negative attitudes of teachers to support children with disabilities, especially in regular schools, hinder the successful implementation of inclusive education. As part of Ghana's uh, education sector analysis, primary uh, for inclusive education, uh, primary data on attitudes of parents was, were gathered to confirm secondary anecdotal evidence. So the main uh, observations and conclusions from this first uh, panel discussion was the need to explore the use of communication for development, C4D, uh, as a strategy to address issues concerning behavior change, especially at community level. Um, it was also uh, recommended that uh, education sector analysis on inclusive education should adopt an entire sector-wide approach from pre-primary to TVET and tertiary levels. Uh, it was also advised that the selection of the relevant stakeholders uh, to the education sector analysis process is critical for successful education sector analysis, learning from the Ghana experience. And here we are mentioning government ministries and agencies, academia, development partners, civil society. Um, then we move to uh, a um, third session on uh, enabling environment with several presentations regarding laws and policies, data and evidence, leadership and management, assessment of system capacity to implement inclusive education and financing of inclusive education. Um, during these uh, uh, presentations and discussions, there were several points made. The first one was about uh, the fact that data collections requires data collector, trained data collectors adequate budget and political will, uh, which often are missing in Africa. So how do we deal with this situation? Uh, second point was the fact that uh, the quality of uh, qualitative data is often a challenge. It is often only a summary of the collected data with no depth of analysis, only a, a, a kind of description of, of uh, the situation. A point was made that uh, when advocating with Ministry of Finance, uh, we need to also um, understand and raise the cost of uh, not doing anything, the cost of inaction. And, um, and it was also the point, uh, <clears throat> a point was raised about the importance to understand how the, to cost for inclusive education within the country. And um, finally, the capacity of the, the issue of the capacity of teachers to provide data on disability and inclusion need to be considered. So um, the response to these points was that um, uh, EMIS and the household surveys are actually uh, platforms for collection data that exist and that actually collecting data for inclusive education does not require uh, huge amounts of um, additional cost. 
Um, consideration will need to be given to different types of disability in the data collection tools and analysis. Um, it is important to analyze the cost of specialized edu special education vis-a-vis -vis inclusive education, and we need to make the case for investment. Uh, there is a need to uh, collaborate more with the Washington Group in uh, collection of uh, in data collection. And a very important point was made that funding should be solution and not a challenge. Uh, so no no magic bullets in terms of financing. Need uh, we need also to rely emp emp empirically on countries' best practices and also rely on existing resources. Um, we then had the last uh, the second panel uh, discussion of the day with uh, four countries. First group was Vietnam and uh, Fiji, and Fiji. Um, so while Vietnam is more advanced in terms of survey data, and uh, and uh, the government is about to launch the national disability survey by end of 2019, Fiji uh, islands are more <coughs> particularly advanced with their Fiji Education Monitoring and Information System, FEMIS. Um, it was a donor-driven support project on the, on the onset, but there has been gradual buy-in and ownership by the government. The system looks into the number of children with disabilities, types of disabilities, level of severity, learning needs, and contains both students' learning profile and school environment aspects. FEMIS has been used successfully in Fiji, as evidenced by the doubling of government budget for both special and inclusive education in the country. The main purpose of uh, Vietnam's data collection is for monitoring, planning of proper interventions, and inform policies. National disability uh, administrative data in Vietnam is under the Ministry of Labor, Invalids, and Social Affairs, with engagement from line ministries, including Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, but there is limited coordination, unfortunately, among these line ministries to harmonize data collection system because each sector is pursuing its own purpose and is using different approaches to collect data. However, both Fiji and Vietnam, I mean, neither Fiji nor Vietnam have actually uh, uh, the data collection on uh, leadership and management. I'm not sure that I understand, <coughs> I understand what this means, but we can discuss this later. Um, and uh, the moment for uh, the period when children with disabilities in both countries drop out is really during the transition period between primary and lower secondary. So, in conclusion, uh, for both countries, uh, it was mentioned that early identification and early intervention mechanisms should be taken into consideration during the development of national strategies for inclusive education. Financing, of edu financing education for children with disabilities should go beyond the education sector's efforts. Should, go, should be a cross-sectoral uh, effort, and cross-sectoral coordination remains a challenge which, which needs specific solutions for both countries. The second, um, the two other countries for this uh, uh, panel on enabling environment were Ethiopia and Ghana. Uh, so Ghana has an inclusive education policy which references both <laughs> international commitments like UNCRPD, CRC, Salamanca state, uh, statement, and national commitments. Um, in Ghana, the 1995 constitution rec recognized the issue, issues of disabilities as a charity. The constitution indicates that government will support only a limited domain of disability, physical, mental, orphans, elderly, within available uh, means and resources. Uh, in Ethiopia, the situation is quite different. There are three policies that marginalize persons with disabilities. These include a uh, module curriculum for Tibet, uh, which specifically say, states that a person should be mentally and physically sound. Then there is a health policy that indicates that those with physical impairment cannot become medical doctors. And a third one, uh, which is the education policy, which renders um, uh, and, and the, uh, 
uh, which renders the uh, name people with disabilities as handicapped. Additionally, before a person becomes a teacher in Ethiopia, that person should be mentally and physically sound. So all these policies in Ethiopia hinder the implementation of inclusive education. Uh, Ghana shares the importance of having quality and reliable data to support allocation of resources. Ghana is spending 80% of its education budget on salaries, leaving very, very little budget for implementation of goods and services. Um, the findings of the education sector analysis on inclusive education mainstreamed um, uh, in, um, in the education sector plan for 2018 2013 was a good way to leverage resource allocation to support the implementation of the COSID policy plan. There are <coughs> critical bottlenecks in data collection, analysis and reporting in both uh, Ghana and Ethiopia. Uh, there are usually discrepancies between the available data in country and those which are actually coming from international um, sources like WHO World Bank. So there is a need for a more consistent and coherent way of collecting, analyzing and reporting on data. Um, finally, um, for the two countries, the conclusions were that both countries alluded to the fact that there is a need for the education policy. This will hold governments uh, binding on the inclusion of children with disabilities in schools. If there are no policies, stakeholders, especially the civil society organization, cannot hold governments accountable for the implementation of inclusive education. Inclusive education policy should be designed together with a costed implementation plan to guide the implementation process. There is also a need for political will and commitment from governments in both countries to support the implementation of inclusive education as a promising practice, Ghana has an established National Steering Committee uh, which has an oversight responsibility for the entire inclusive implementation of inclusive education in the country. And uh, finally, in ensuring sustainability of the gains of inclusive education, countries should move away from project delivery mode of implementation and adopt a countrywide programming systemic way owned by the government uh, uh, owned by government, yes. So, yeah, that's uh, that's it. Um, and uh, if the organizer allow me to move away from my role of uh, rapporteur, I have a point that I would like to make. <laughs> Before we move to supply, I will have to just to say something on the inclusive education framework, because Mark mentioned yesterday that it is still uh, in the draft, so there is any change, anything that could be changed. In my view, I think this part of the framework should not be on the top, it should be on the back. And in my view, it should not be named, it should not be called enabling environment, it should be called supporting environment. Because if you, <coughs> leave it on the top that leads to the thinking that these are the conditions to actually implement uh, inclusive education. And we all know that all these conditions will not be made in most countries because of the all countries in the world. So this can lead to the perception that if you don't have all this in place, and you can wait for <laughs> to have all this in place before you start implementing inclusive education. It is contrary to the principle of progressive realization, which means that you are not, <coughs> you are not, a, no country is expected to have all data system in place, to have all the finance, the budget, and to be able to to include uh, children with a very very severe disability in a classroom. I think uh, 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 general comment number four on Article Twenty Four mentioned that countries are expected to do whatever they can. So I think that this is a supporting environment to the implementation of inclusive education. Yeah. But this is a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. I just, well, can, I, can I just respond to that? And then, and then yeah. Jimmy, Jim and then Jimmy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that's a good idea, uh, Philippe. I was also thinking maybe we could put it down the side 
because like I was trying to say in my brief like, presentation on it, the enabling environment's got to take place at the different levels of the system. It's got to be at the national level, subnational yeah. school. Mm -hmm. So we could put it like a column down the side, so we get rid of the hierarchy uh, construct, you know, the gym yeah. Well, I just wanted to echo that because we had a we had the same discussion yesterday in the body college, and we felt that it was actually a bottleneck in the way it now prevents the construction of the next Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It'll go really nicely with what I have to say. We didn't get a chance to introduce Philippe. Uh, Philippe Tistofiri is a former um, education advisor in the ECA, Eastern Europe, Central Asia region of UNICEF. Uh, that's uh, a champion region for UNICEF in promoting and implementing inclusive education. Um, he, he's got a wealth of knowledge and um, I wanted to point out to you that there were some materials that we have developed um, a, a conceptual framework is one of uh, the materials, but we also have prepared the one-pagers and they are, uh, it, it, we called it a toolkit. So if you look in your um, packets, and I'm sure you have already, so you've got the one-pagers and they're numbered uh, based on the conceptual framework and now we have panels organized um, around the conceptual framework and then we're going into group work as well. So all of uh, these materials were developed, uh, taken some of the information from the technical booklets, the 14 technical booklets that have been developed by the ECHA region of UNICEF. They've been available for a number of years. So if you want some more information, you can actually go online and watch a webinar, and you'll still see Dan Mont <laughs> there, but a much longer presentation, and you can read a few uh, more pages of of uh, background information because they come with a technical booklet, the companion booklets with for the webinar. So that's one thing to mention. And another thing that this morning it came across to me that we didn't actually um, introduce it yet, or we didn't uh, talk about why uh, the eight countries that we have here, why why are you here? How did the how did we make this decision? It is not regional, right? Um, so I think some, some of you started to realize that after the panel discussion. And if you look at the conceptual framework, as we were discussing the agenda or conceptualizing the event, we thought, well, it would be great to have some examples from countries that have made progress, right? So we looked around the world and thought, well, let's, let's I, I've had experience working in Ethiopia a number of years ago in the resource centers and our satellite schools, and it, in a way it's being promoted as a model, and many countries want to learn, well, you cannot convert, you cannot make every single school inclusive overnight, but that's a way um, you can do it. So we thought that would be interesting for Ethiopia to come and share this experience. In Kenya, you have a really interesting um, teacher training program, inclusive teacher training program, that's been active and operational for a number of years, so we thought that would be really interesting to share with countries as well. Ghana, as you know, recently um, done an education sector analysis on inclusive education and is now in the process of uh, implementing or launching implementation of inclusive education sector plan. South Africa is uh, a bit more advanced than many countries in the world in implementing inclusive education policy, so we thought it would be very interesting to learn from them. Uh, challenges and uh, what went well in, in this implementation. Um, going down to um, Asia, in Cambodia, you have had a very successful, a very interesting disability screening program and um, that also was connected to mapping of services and provision of assistive devices. There was some a vision screening program, there was a general disability screening, so we thought that would be interesting for countries to learn. Vietnam, as you know, has done really well in data collection, disability data collection, which is a very important topic. Then uh, Fiji, uh, we learned yesterday about the um, open EMIS, uh, and I was really glad to hear about that because I've heard so much about open EMIS in Fiji, but it was amazing to... <laughs> to um, and then Nepal, you uh, have had um, incorporated scholarships for children with disabilities as part of your education um, sector plan, so we thought that would be interesting as well. 
If you want more information, we have also compiled country profiles that are also in your toolkit. So with just a bit more background, again, they're not most the most accurate or the most complete, but we have compiled them for the purposes of the, of the round table. So um, I will proceed now. We will, yes. yes. We would like feedback on everything. Uh, the country profiles uh, would be amazing if you could update uh, the information or check whether information is accurate, whether it's the most up to date. Um, uh, there are two pages on each one. They are in your, they are in your, um, in your toolkit. Uh, just one second, um, and then also in the conceptual framework. Again, it's the draft and the one pages. We have prepared the toolkit with one pages to be shared during the round table, but it doesn't mean it's a finished and, and finally printed um, resource. One question, and we will. I just want to ask the, the country profiles is it possible to email it to us because the word versions, because then we can update it? Absolutely, the yes, absolutely. absolutely. And I think Jennifer will explain more maybe tomorrow on how we will be keeping in touch and what will be the, the process um, after the round table. Um, so I will now proceed on to uh, uh, the session that I'm supposed to be facilitating. I'm very sorry for the slight deviation, but uh, <clears throat> we will be um, introducing the supply side of the conceptual framework. We will hear a very quick, like everybody else, a 10-minute presentation, overview. Nobody is going to become an expert after that. Uh, on teachers' infrastructure and learning materials. Then we're now experts in doing the concurrent sessions. So we will have two panels. Um, Kenya and Ghana will be in one room, and Vietnam and Nepal in the other, we apologize if your country just had to talk a lot yesterday and has to talk again today. Um, and uh, again, the panels will switch and uh, the audience will stay in the rooms. Um, and then we will uh, finish with a fun coffee break activity. So I will uh, over to the Grace Wood. Thank you. Hello. Great. Good. Okay, so um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Grace Wood. I'm from DFID, currently based in Pakistan, um, but moving to Ghana soon. So it's great to be here uh, learning about the Ghana experience and everyone else's as well. Um, so today we looked at uh, the inclusive education conceptual framework um, and we delved into some planning issues around the enabling or supporting environment. Um, and today we're going to be going deeper into some planning issues around service delivery. So um, over the next 10 minutes, hopefully, um, I'm going to take you through uh, some, of, some, some of the, uh, well, the top three supply side factors that are outlined in the, in the framework um, that we need to consider in planning. Um, so these are around teachers' infrastructure and learning materials. So the first area I'm going to focus on is around teachers. So as we know, teachers are central to uh, ensuring that inclusive education can happen in the classroom. Um, but of course, teaching to different levels can be very complex and overwhelming. Um, and many teachers report that they lack the confidence um, and the capacity and the skills uh, to ensure inclusive teaching and learning um, to the right level for, for all different learning needs. Um, and as a former teacher myself, I understand how complex that can be. Um, but inclusive education can only really work if all teachers have the competencies to be able to promote inclusive learning environments um, rather than what we usually see, which is only some teachers specializing in special education or doing sort of modules in special education. Um, so, so we need to plan um, on how we, we're going to change teachers' approaches and classroom behaviors so that they can adopt and promote inclusive pedagogies. So by inclusive pedagogy, um, I mean the concept of teaching all children with and without disabilities together, um, adapting approaches to children's diverse learning needs um, and their interests and capacities, 
and seeing students as a resource and active participants in their own learning and in others' learning as well. Um, now, a, a concept or an approach that is proposed uh, to, to help with this or to think about when, when planning this is universal design for learning. Um, so this is a, an aim, this aims to design curricula and pedagogy to meet the needs of all learners from the outset. So this is through sort of three main principles around um, multiple means of representation. So multiple ways of um, representing what is to be learnt, um, multiple means of uh, of action or expression, so different ways that children can express how they're learning, um, and multiple means of engagement, so um, different ways that uh, children can understand and be motivi motivated about why they learn. Um, so this aims to provide children with multiple learning pathways, diverse uh, content in different ways, and multiple ways to express what they've learned. Um, so it's it's about not ap approaching teaching with, not with a one size fits all approach, um, but expect going into the classroom as a teacher, expecting all children to have different learning needs and planning for that from the outset. So um, when, thinking, when, when thinking about how we plan for this, um, I think the first thing that we would probably think about is to, uh, is around teacher capacity needs um, and, and assessing this. So that would involve collecting data um, on teacher perceptions um, of, of teaching different learning needs. Um, so how confident teachers feel to do that already um, and various inclusive education practices that might already be happening or, um, or might have potential to happen. Um, we would also need to think about planning uh, teacher training, so both initial teacher training and in-service teacher training. Um, so the aim really should be for all mainstream teachers to receive uh, inclusive uh, in, in, initial teacher training on inclusive education, and then for there to be in-service uh, training uh, in schools or in clusters of schools to, to be able to share resources and ideas. Um, and the, the training curriculum um, might include um, how to identify and respond to different uh, learning needs, um, how to, different ways of stimulating children's participation, um, again, how, how to use positive discipline practices um, so that uh, disc discrimination and segregation isn't being um, replicated within classrooms, um, how to address bullying and stigma if they arise, um, and how to sort of change moving around the room using different resources, um, things like that. Uh, and, and the last area would be around planning for support for teachers. So this isn't a, uh, there's no silver bullet for how to address different learning needs. Um, and it, it's something that needs to be a continual and sort of reflexive uh, practice. Um, and teachers need to be supported in this. Um, so that could be creating, through creating, or think about how to create uh, support um, for communities of practice between uh, between teachers, uh, links between mainstream schools and teachers and uh, special schools or resource centres, um, as well as planning for additional classroom support. So teaching assistants um, can be a great support for improving uh, learning for, for children with difficulties. So moving on to um, infrastructure. Uh, so uh, children with disabilities need to be able to get to and move around schools. Um, but transportation and buildings um, may not be disability accessible and there might be various barriers um, which then contribute to issues around enrolment, attendance, um, dropout and learning issues. Um, so the first consideration that I'd suggest in planning would be around identifying what some of these barriers might be um, for children to get to and then around schools. Um, so as we discussed yesterday, this, this would mean collecting some data on um, school accessibility. So that can be done through administrative EMIS systems, um, but also I'd suggest through qualitative studies because we want to know not only which facilities are available or which might be seen to be accessible, but how they're actually used, um, the perceptions of their accessibility and safety or not. Um, and then for new schools, um, 
okay, I've got five minutes first. For new schools, um, we, we'd want to think about planning along um, universal design principles. So an, another concept here around which which basically focuses on designing all new schools, uh, new, all new school construction, so that it can be usable by all people. Um, so without need of need for further adaptations. Um, and as Dan said yesterday, if this is thought of from the beginning, then the additional cost um, is likely to be very low. He suggested around. 1% additional um, rather than retrofitting later. Um, but we're all working with existing school buildings and school systems. Um, so adaptations also need to be planned for. We're not going to be building everything from scratch. Um, so we need to think about how to plan to make existing school environments more accessible, um, which could include thinking about um, access to the schools, um, thinking about how to ensure roads to schools are safe um, and are obstacle free, um, that all people can use the same entrances to schools and what that would need. Um, same entrances to classrooms and washrooms, that might mean installing ramps, handrails, um, uh, easy to open doors, things like this. Um, it might mean thinking about how to make floors wider and smoother, um, installing larger windows and better lighting, um, and thinking also about accessible, functional and safe water and sanitation facilities. And we've been doing quite a lot of um, these various components in Pakistan. And I can, uh, I've got a little video that I can uh, show to people who might be interested later about some of the things that we've been supporting there. Um, AusAid also has some really good guidance about um, different ways that schools can be made more accessible. Um, and, and then just the last bit on infrastructure, um, transport is often overlooked, I think, um, as uh, an area to focus on, but it's, it's a really key enabler for children with disabilities to be able to enrol in and attend schools regularly. Um, and while it's, it's often planned for, as a provision for special schools, it's not often thought of um, uh, in as great uh, detail for, for mainstream schools. Um, so we should think about how we could, could plan for more, for accessible transportation to mainstream schools. And that also could have a wider benefit on children who are poorer, um, girls as well, and particularly at the higher levels of education where um, schools might be further apart. Um, there's also often frequent demand from parents. I have one minute. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, just, uh, uh, it's just some images of some adaptations that are made. Um, and then just the last area around learning materials. So. Children with disabilities need to be able to access the curriculum and uh, and information in multiple formats <laughs> that they can read and understand and use um, so that they can particip participate effectively in the classrooms. Um, but as we know, learning materials may not be uh, adapted for various needs. So again, the first consideration when planning would be around identifying um, barriers to student learning and then different formats which might help children to learn more effectively. Um, and what I would suggest here is seeking views from teachers and children about um, about what innovations might be taking place in the classroom, what children, how children like to learn. We often don't ask children enough, I don't think, about uh, different ways that they like to absorb information. Um, <clears throat> we need to pl plan to provide uh, mainstream learning materials like books or textbooks, um, stationary exercise sheets, assessments, um, in a range of alternative formats. Um, so these can be cost effective and, and low tech. We often think, go straight to sort of braille printing presses and things like this, which are quite expensive. Um, but it could be things like, you know, using video more with audio and subtitles, using large print formats, um, using symbols and picture boards, grip, print, grip pencils. Um, but also acknowledging that for children with some more severe difficulties, uh, we will also need to uh, plan to provide disability specific technology where we can. Um, so that, that could involve um, braille reading, writing and keyboard equipment, um, text or type to speech uh, software, um, things like audiobooks and sign language videos. Um, and we've been working with a partner in Sindh province in Pakistan around development of sign language videos and storybooks um, on video, which are really exciting. So I can also show uh, that to some people later if they would be interested. Um, and, and then just the last thing um, I'd like to raise around learning materials. It's slightly, maybe it's, it's not on the board, but around personal assistive devices. I didn't really know what area this would fit into, but I think um, you know, for 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 children with some milder, mod, um, more moderate um, difficulties, um, provision of personal assistive devices, just uh, spectacles or magnifiers for lower vision or hearing aids and batteries, um, 
uh, recorders and things like that can really make a difference to, um, to, to their learning. So I think we need to think about how we can um, plan for providing uh, those assistive devices uh, where they can help to, uh, uh, to overcome barriers to, to learning and engagement in the classroom. Um, and, and just one last thing, all of, all of these areas um, I think will involve collaboration and partnering with across ministries, um, also with private sector and NGOs um, to be able to, to uh, procure quality devices. Okay, I'm over time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Grace. Uh, and just to remind everybody, the sessions are really short and I know that there's a lot of information that needs to be covered and you just can list it. If you if you want to know a little bit more, not much more, the, the one pages, please don't yeah. forget. And that could also help in asking questions to our panels. Um, because the panels now, you know, the panelists have been chosen because they've done something in that area. Right. So now we will be going into and it's five and six and seven. These are the pages that uh, Grace presented on. Um, <clears throat> and we will be going into panels now. So two panels, uh, panel four and um, and panel five, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya, and Ghana are the panelists. And for Southeast Asia and the Pacific, we have Vietnam and Nepal as panelists. So who wants to stay here and who wants to move? Kenya and Ghana stay here. Okay. And then the, the Great. Indians, it's yeah. the Asian Pacific, yeah. moves next door. Right. Yeah. So the opposite so, yesterday. Yep. Okay, so yeah, please. Yes, yes, please. Please, one question. Yep. Yes. If you can give us a little bit of the panel. If there are any questions that I uh, cannot in the moment, you need to find me or any one of the organizers or send an email. Um, and we still have the forums open. So. I mean, I have to like, like, yeah. I don't have the opportunity to actually contribute to, to talk with this presentation. Then, I think it's important. I would yes. think in the panels you can address some of these issues, and I think we can collect questions. Mm. And then perhaps Grace could could be present. Yeah. yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And so she'll be available to answer questions during the panel sessions. I think that would be one way of doing it. Would that be one? Would that be acceptable? Yeah? yeah. I think because for now, otherwise we're running out of time, mm -hmm. and that would be then a bit of an issue in terms of the agenda. So I, I suggest we go into the panel, and then we can, you know, the questions can be raised, and then we'll make sure that that Trace gets these questions to respond to. So the first, how, uh, Tori, do you want to advise us on how much time we have, considering that we're 15 minutes late? So right now, um, the panels are going to run about five minutes shorter than what was originally planned. Okay. Um, if the first, let's give uh, Vietnam and Nepal an opportunity to start heading over next door, and then everyone else follow in a minute if you're starting next door. Okay. So we have about 40 minutes then for yes. the first panel. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great.
question. The idea is that, oh, sorry, thank you. So uh, just like yesterday, the idea is that we start the discussion uh, with a trigger question and then we throw it open to the audience to ask follow-up questions or additional questions that come out of the answers, yeah? So should we start with, um, should we start with Ghana today? Oh, uh, introduce everybody. Okay, so uh, every, everybody knows I'm Mark Waltham, I'm from UNICEF. Would you like to go around? And I'm sure everybody also knows, knows that I'm Rhoda <laughs> from Ghana. <laughs> I'm also Jaleel Odum. And I'm Wesley Oti. Keep going. Yes. Yeah. I'm Susan Masila representing the DPOs Kenya. Fred Haga, Minister of Education, Kenya. Michael Kahiti, Minister of Education, Kenya. I think we're actually beginning to get to know each other, um, aren't we? <laughs> okay, so starting, starting with Ghana, the, the idea is that we ask a question, please give us sort of a, a general description, yeah? And um, try and be as provocative as possible. So, <laughs> to stimulate some questions and some good discussion. So the trigger question is, what was the starting point? Where did, it, where did it start? Where did inclusive education start in your country, in Ghana? Yeah. And so was it a project? Was it a ministry initiative? Did it come from DPOs? Did it come a long time ago, you know, in independence in 1959? 57? 57, yeah. Wait, so where was the starting point? in your country and how has it progressed since then inclusive education you're gonna to have to think about this <laughs> and just uh, for for kenya start thinking about the answers of the same question <laughs> Okay, I, I, I would say from uh, the DPO perspective, I'm sure there are other views. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, in, I won't talk about inclusive education first. I'll talk about segregation first. We, as a country, from 2003, we started the special school uh, concept, and it has evolved. It, it then got into integration around 2005. And um, between 2003 and 2013 also, there was some pilots. Of course, that, that was also around the time uh, Salamanca has happened and other, um, uh, I would say, uh, treaties around uh, inclusive education had happened. So as a country, we started piloting um, in several districts, not not throughout the country, but at least uh, it started with some regions and then um, it spread to about eight regions of 10 regions. Um, so by 2013, I think what it was, was that as a country, we thought that we had learned something. And then now um, the conversation on trying to set the direction of what we want to do as a country for inclusive education came, came up and uh, um, the the blind union um, of the country instigated it to try to find try to find resources to start you know to push for the agenda of having a policy and then um, uh, UNICEF came through Ministry of education now decided that now it's time for us to have a policy. But certainly there was several pilots over, I mean, um, a decade, you know, on inclusive education. And so our policy is based on evidence on what works and what does not work. Basically, that's the perspective I'll share from the DPO. So yeah, briefly, in 2002, our government commissioned a reform and it, to look at the challenges of education in the 21st century. And that report, among other things, made emphasis on 
they need to attend to the persons with diverse educational needs. So out of that report in 2003, we outdoor the our strategic plan for 2003 to 2015. And within that component we had a specific strategic objective to do mainstream as well as do segregation so it emphasized on persons with mild, mild and moderate disabilities to be mainstreamed within the documents so that was the takeoff as at the time i came privy to documents and then implementation so around that time we have been doing special schools as well as some pockets of mainstream in mostly what's revolving around the senior high school levels that's where we have the mainstream that's where it started so that's how far we have come and then when we had to review the 2003 to 2015 document at midterm review in 2007 and by then we've gone for a, a complete education reforms which led to widening the education scope and then bringing in kindergarten as part of the formal education we had to consider some of these things again. So that is the genesis in terms of the ministry's documents and then implementation. Yeah. It's quite a common story, isn't it? I, I, I mean, that resonates with me from a number of countries. Kenya, do you want to give the same sort of history? Yeah. Um, Kenya had segregated uh, schooling from the late 40s through to the 60s when we got our independence. Um, however, as early as the 1960s, when the government commissioned uh, a report about reforms in education, it was proposed that there are certain levels of disability that could be um, integrated um, in the regular schools. But we start seeing um, specific disabilities, especially learners with visual and physical disabilities, um, being integrated in, in, in regular schools, especially from the late 70s through the 80s. But the influence of civil society organizations and partners entrench Integra integration from the late 80s, but it's until 2000, uh, the 2000s, when we first consciously start discussing inclusive education in the country. For instance, the teacher training program um, in the mid 2000s introduced a program where teachers are specifically being trained on inclusive education. Um, but the policy caught up with the process a bit later because in 2009, that's when you first see a policy that mentions inclusive education. In 2010, the constitution um, makes a provision that is definitely open to interpretation, but it talks about uh, education services in institutions integrated in society and, and for some advocates, they believe that that's a bit of inclusion. Um, now, that so-called gain, again, um, had a bit of a challenge in the 2013 Basic Education Act, which provides for the establishment of special schools. Um, however, this year, a policy was launched that is very strong on inclusion and all through that process i think civil society organizations have played a really strong part in influencing uh, the whole thought and practice on inclusive education <coughs> in the country <coughs> but even as these um, ngos implement projects i think there's been a bit of a, a disconnect um, in, in the definition or understanding of what inclusive education is. Because one organization could be talking about inclusive education, but you look at it and you're not so sure that really this is inclusive education. 
However, the government policy that has recently been launched is trying to consolidate all those gains and have a clear direction on what inclusive education, particularly for learners with uh, disabilities, um, should have. And, and that's where we are at the moment. question or comment rather. Please, I was just going to ask for yeah. questions and comments. <laughs> um, our colleagues from Ghana are so very young <laughs> that um, that their, um, their perspective might be might be a bit shorter than mine. Um, I remember uh, in 1995 UNESCO was involved in Ghana in piloting inclusive education. It was a very ambitious um, pilot um, project and uh, and as years have gone by. And I, I've seen a number of pilot projects, and and I, 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 I think um, as you all described that the that the development has been has been very long, and I, I think that's one of the issues is that how to 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 scale up the pilots and uh, and I would I would like to hear from you. Do you have a good experience of scaling up the pilots, and what are those experiences, and or what can we learn from pilots? Because because that's that's really very critical. We try out things, but we don't know how to to take them forward. You can, you can speak. I'm sure. uh, this is for Lando from UNICEF. I just want to build on the issue of piloting. It's also about sustainability, and my anxiety with piloting is that it, it becomes like beginning and an end. And you know, we real inclusive education is supposed to be a never ending process. And the tendency of piloting is that there's supposed to be an end for a school to be piloted. And after that, we leave the school. And even the funding agencies, for instance, international funding organizations, is that they have a limit and like an end to fund like piloting. So building on scalability, it's also sustainability of piloting and how do we ensure that we keep supporting the schools not saying that we've done the pilot project and then we go to another school and stop giving the support to the to the pilot schools thanks so i agree if you look at the um, ghana's inclusive education policy the policy objective goal four talks about how do we sustain the gains we get from all these pilots and ensure that government owns the entire inclusive education program. And so there's been several fora for discussion on how we scale up the pilots. Um, UNICEF has done a bit of these um, supports um, with funding support from USAID. We have selected some district to see the benefits of implementing inclusive education so that that could even be a learning or that we could leverage on that to um, influence government's decision to scale up. Currently, we have a national steering committee that has oversight responsibility on implementation of inclusive education. And what this committee seeks to do is to look for ways to scale up the initial pilots that have been done in the country. And I think the, the enabling environment is good for us because um, government is also finding ways and means of scaling up. For example, currently we have two reforms taken up, um, currently happening with, with regards to our curriculum. Um, curriculum at the pre-service level, training all teachers who come out to the classroom to teach to make sure that they're able to do the basic identification, they're able to identify the, the diverse learning needs in the classroom and support these kids. So it's, it's evolving. Um, we are not there yet, but government is looking for ways and means of scaling up the gains that we have gained from, from the pilots. Um, I want to add, um, in terms of uh, the committees that we've set up, uh, one is coordination. Coordination because, like you mentioned, UNESCO, you did something in 1995. Of course, Salamanca was 1994. So obviously, when we came back to Ghana, we wanted to pilot something. Now, um, 
there are scattered of information around things that people are doing. Even NGOs are doing very significant things like World Vision is doing some things in some districts and things like that. Now we want to bring all these things together. We want to make sure there is a direction. We are all doing it in the right way. I mean, in one way, that kind of thing. Um, but aside that, um, I think one of the things that we want to ensure, talking about uh, sustainability, is trying to map resources at very local level. Now, we see that, of course, government is uh, the, the financier of inclusive education, obviously. Um, but we want to make sure that local people are taking, you know, um, local um, um, decisions and they are they are raising their own resources to be able to finance I mean uh, inclusive education at local level so as part of the plan we are trying to map out I mean all I mean, uh, service providers actors uh, even private you know organs or organizations who are able to support this process and we think that somehow some of these things is going to sustain the system. Just to just to add that, from what Grace presented, the three main areas, the teachers, the CLMS, and then infrastructure, these are the preconditions that you need to broaden across to be able to deliver inclusive education at scale. And we have started with the CLMS, the curriculum with the teachers. So we'll be able to get to scale. But what is also important, which I'm throwing back to you, the audiences, maybe you have to look at the term pilot and try to redefine it because basically use a pilot to see whether something would work. But if something is critical and it's important to carry on and you, from beginning you call it a pilot, it means it will end at the point. So we may also have to look at the terminologies. So we start with something that will gradually move on rather than calling it a pilot yeah yeah thank you very much i think uh, what we have seen all along in the history of uh, inclusive education is that government was taking a back seat whereas the faith-based organizations and the civil society was the one leading the initiative but currently now the situation is changing and that is why we are now talking confidently because government has now taken it up and it is now providing a policy framework how the country will be galvanized together to actually work in a multidisciplinary way in one forum to actually see the gains coming and being tracked at a certain level. And I think that is the difference now that we can say there is a big hope that when government takes over and now coordinate everybody else, we are seeing good changes coming. Thank you. Actually, uh, one interesting point that, that came out of both of those presentations is that <clears throat> in some cases, practice on the ground, inclusive education sort of in classrooms, was taking place before the policy changes, which sort of backs up Philippe's idea of putting the enabling environment at the bottom. It's not a, it's not a precondition, it, it's a supporting condition. Yeah, I rather like that. Yes, please. Um, oh, thank you. I really appreciate your comment about um, needing to kind of map resources at the at the local level um, as you're looking at this, particularly in a decentralized environment. I wonder, um, again, kind of as we were talking yesterday, the fact that these changes take so much time um, as you look at phasing up and scaling up, have you gotten into practices that we should all consider about how to do that in terms of your your sector plan per se and how that plays out in, di in different districts? In other words, for example, just with, um, with teacher training, we know that it, so much has to happen in terms of ongoing IST and involvement of the inspectorate and other things so that the interventions don't just fade. Are there... Are there aspects of your sector plan development per se that you've uh, included incorporation, phased costing, and, and that kind of thing in terms of the plan? Yeah, 
<clears throat> um, I'm not sure to, to what extent there are special schools in each of your countries, but lots of times when we talk about inclusive education, we talk about turning the special schools into resource centers. Um, and we talk about that a lot. I haven't actually seen that very much because there, because there's there's barriers and resistance to that. So I, I'm wondering if uh, a whether you have tried to do that and in in your countries to transform those special schools into into uh, resource or supporting centers, and uh, if you were to do it, what 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 would be your, your advice be to, to a country that is that wants to make that transition? <laughs> Morning, I'm Sandy from uh, South African Disability Alliance. Um, I mentioned yesterday that we're struggling a little bit with um, attitudes of inclusion. So I'd be quite interested to hear about Kenya's inclusive teacher training program. We've gone through quite significant teacher training um, in terms of the principles of inclusion and, and the teachers understand that and they understand that it's important. They don't get the how. So I'd be quite interested to hear if you've been successful in teaching those teachers the how to actually do it rather than the principles. Good morning. Um, Andre Vivia from UNICEF South Africa. Um, I want to ask, and um, if Grace come in, she can also respond to that, and it's actually to the broader framework as well. But knowing that Kenya and Ghana are both countries that have also very sound policies and programs in early childhood, and I've raised the question yesterday, and I yet have to find the answer, um, is when we talk about inclusive education, it's not only about schooling. It's also what happens preschool in terms of early learning and development. Because we need, as much as we advocate, and, and that is for me the, the, the problem with the discourse at this point, um, as much as we advocate for all children to have early learning and development opportunities in our discourse on inclusive education, we neglect that. We, we don't go there where we talk about data, policies, leadership and management. And maybe from Ghana and Kenya, who is on the continent, one of or some of the leading countries in early childhood development as well, what are you doing in terms of making sure that on the supply side, the practitioners, the teachers, the infrastructure, and importantly, the learning materials from an early age as birth right through in your early learning programs facilitate inclusive, inclusive uh, inclusion, but also helping children with disabilities to be more prepared and ready to enter a more formal education system. Those questions first. Yeah. So I'll start with the last question on the ECD bit. Um, Ghana also strongly believe that a child needs that strong foundation to prepare that child um, for primary school. For all our interventions that we have supported government to implement in Ghana, we have paid a critical look at the early, early years in a child's life. So right from zero to five years, which is from your nursery or your crash to your, um, how do you call it, your KG2, kindergarten two, we have made sure that interventions in the area of screening, identification and referral, we look at that. We also look at capacity building for the teachers. We also look at sensitization for the parents at the community level and also building that strong linkage between the community and the school so that they support that child to thrive and to prepare that foundation to progress to the next level. So we have made conscious efforts to include the pre-primary in all our interventions. And as I mentioned yesterday, government is also in the process of um, doing a national screening um, for all um, children right from zero till tertiary um, level. And UNICEF has been engaged in that discussion between the Ministry of Health and Education, making sure that children right from that age are also in the picture. Set a plan. 
Our current plan spans over 12 years, and we've identified what is critical for the first four years, which is in line with the medium-term plan. And yesterday, I was saying to you, one of our participants, that in education, everything is a priority, but we have to prioritize within the priorities because we don't have all the financial resources available. And even if they do, we may not have the capacity to do all that. So within the plan, even with the curriculum that is being reviewed, both at the teacher education level and then the school level, we've put that in phases. By September, we are taking off the early grade curriculum. And then we'll continue to work on the upper primary curriculum and then junior high, they move to senior high over the, the four years. But we are facing up to I have up to junior high level, we have to finish within the four years, and then the senior high level will look that into the next cycle. So we are very much aware of the amount involved and then the amount of work that has to be done, but we have faced them and put them in stages to allow us to be able to address those needs. So that is what I want to say. There is a program we have in Ghana which emphasizes more on how the health systems prepare parents to appreciate and accept children that they have who have disabilities. Because we found how it's communicated to the parents makes them to, to shut down. And that's the, the genesis of beginning to hide the kids at home and not even to come out to them. So those are some of the things we are looking at, which I want to talk about in addition to what my colleague mentioned. Yeah. Talking about transforming uh, um, special schools to resource centers, of course, um, it has all been a conversation, but um, the only thing we have tried to do right now is um, to reduce the resistance in the system because um, earlier on when we started talking about all this inclusive education, what uh, the special educators were thinking was that we we're going to close down special schools. So um, as much as possible, we have tried to reduce the resistance of what the approach is regarding, you know, trying to um, rather turn it into resource centers. Um, I think it is, it is welcoming. So it, it is the next stage of actually making it what we, we have said we are going to do. And of course, that is where we are. Um, just to add a bit to that, um, fortunately for us, um, Ghana has also won a trust fund from the World Bank and we'll be doing an analysis of the current stage of our resource, our special schools and assessment centers. And I think that would also be a good way to see what the gaps are and how we can prepare ourselves well to turn them into resource centers so that they can support the mainstream schools to implement IE. Okay, I'm going to uh, answer the question on uh, early learning and ECD. Uh, currently, uh, Kenya just underwent a new curriculum reform. Uh, it's being implemented this year. It started being implemented this year. And this curriculum reform, uh, uh, the new curriculum puts a lot of emphasis on uh, early childhood activities because what was happening before, our curriculum was so academic oriented. And you would find that even at ECD level, children with disabilities could not fit anywhere because all the teachers wanted was the grade, grade, grade. But now the new curriculum has moved away from the, the grading system. It's more computers based. It's assessing the child in a diverse um, continuum of activities, not only academics. And this is uh, it's really encouraging parents to bring out their children and uh, even taking their children to mainstream schools because they won't have the negative feedback they've been having before. So this has really helped uh, so much in developing uh, uh, children with disabilities at that age. The other thing that is really supporting this, uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned, we just launched a new 
uh, policy in special needs education, which cuts across from early childhood to university level. And this is also providing guidelines for teachers, for parents, and for all the education um, stakeholders on how to support learning at that age. So I think this gives the whole idea of early childhood education in Kenya concerning children with disabilities a paradigm shift from where we were before. Um, then I also want to mention something on the resource centers. I know my colleague Fred is going to answer that, but I want to, uh, to pose a challenge I have experienced. Um, I don't think in, in reality it will be possible to phase out 100% the special schools. Why? Um, we just did a project where we were bringing children who, uh, with intellectual disabilities who are out of school to school, and 40% of the population we recruited could not really fit in our school system as they were because they needed they needed very diverse accommodative uh, aspects to be put in place. And they couldn't go to the schools as they were because maybe they have multiple disabilities, they need a lot, a lot of specialized equipment. And so this question uh, made us question, do we, we, can we really phase out the special school? So it's like, it's a topic we are still grappling with, but I think Fred will be able to answer that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, like, 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 like we mentioned earlier, I think one of the challenges has, has been the understanding or the definition of really what inclusive educational approaches or strategies are, because. Um, Sometimes, even in our country, we give examples of citing why it really cannot work. And the examples we are giving really are not those of inclusive education. They are more or less of integration and all that. But I want to speak to the question of teacher training. Um, around 2003, 2004, the country um, uh, revised it, it, its uh, teacher development program put a module on inclusive education. <coughs> and the goal was to have at least one teacher trained in inclusive education in every, um, especially primary school in the country. And so the Kenya Institute of Special Education began training teachers in hundreds and thousands. And at some point it appeared like we did, we were going to meet our goal of having at least one trained teacher in every school to provide support to the remaining uh, teachers. Now, the teacher management um, body, that's the body that hires and um, pays teachers, thought that they would make a contribution in terms of providing an incentive to teachers who are um, teaching um, in special schools. So this additional allowance was crafted in a way that it benefited teachers who are in our special schools. So even those teachers who had otherwise had training on inclusive education began seeking for ways of going back to the special schools because that was a real motivator. And, and that defeated the whole idea why the training on inclusive education had been introduced. Um, as, as we are meeting here in Paris, what I hear from back home is that I think the Teacher Service Commission is reconsidering um, that, that position and they might scrap it altogether so that um, it, it's no longer there. Perhaps that might um, uh, help the, the, the goal of having teachers who are trained in inclusive education, at least in every school um, you know, in, in Kenya. And, and even that training was mainly focusing on inclusion of learners with disability, not all vulnerabilities. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge that we had with, with that. Um, the, 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 the other issue that I want to talk to is this one of, of, of um, 
special schools being converted to resource centers. I agree with you, that's something we do here quite a lot. One of the leading special schools in the country, that's a school for the blind in a town called Thika, once introduced what they were calling reverse integration. It's a school for children who are blind or visually impaired, but they started admitting um, students who are sighted. And, and this brought a lot of issues because the funding that the government would provide to that school um, was meant for accommodation. And I think it, it's not very clear whether the administration of the school uh, fully declared that, well, I have X number of learners who are cited, and therefore I don't need money for that number. But also the DPOs, the lobby groups, who are really entrenched in special or segregated schooling, started feeling that we have cited students who are taking up um, chances that otherwise would be long. Um, to, 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 to learners who are visually impaired. So that process or that project was, was, was halted for a while and, 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 and it has not proceeded. I, I want to give another um, a situation. Around about the time, that's 2003-2004, when discussions on inclusive education especially for learners with disabilities, was gaining currency. Um, uh, 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 it, what were called special units were introduced in regular schools. So these special units were like holding uh, classrooms to prepare learners so that they can be uh, let into the regular classrooms. Yes. And, um, and, 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 and these were learners with all sorts of disabilities, including those with intellectual disabilities. But while the intention was really to prepare these learners to sort of like join the mainstream classrooms, what we ended up seeing is that specially trained teachers who are very territorial in Kenya, by the way, started holding on to the, these learners in those special units because they would get that incentive if they had a particular threshold of learners in those classrooms. And, and, and that's where we get the phenomenon of, of, of learners really staying in school for many, many years because those special teachers, at least some of them, not all, but some of them want to maintain a certain number in those special units because that's when they, they have that, that incentive. But the idea was to hold them as they, they're prepared and then they are led to the mainstream classrooms and supported in those classrooms. But that, I'm sorry to say, didn't work very well. Thank you. We have one, one minute left. Yeah, just uh, to answer one on uh, the sector plans. Uh, there was a question like that, that uh, although we are doing very well in the pilots, are we seeing this being incorporated in the sector plan? And I want to say on this that uh, we, have, we are in the process of concluding an education sector analysis and uh, the drafting of the sector plan is ongoing. And this is uh, that feeding directly from the sector analysis and therefore the inclusive education is finding its way squarely within the sector plan and therefore what is being seen in the special uh, schools or the, the special needs education and disability is actually finding itself in our plan it is going to be catered for thank you which is the mechanism for mainstreaming yeah. yes we have now very well uh, good strategies in the plan of how now the disability mainstreaming will be done thank you <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, the panel's now switched, don't they? Yeah, just one, one small announcement. We'll have, after, the, after the switch, we'll have another panel discussion, and then we'll have a coffee with an activity, which I'll explain at the end of your panel what the activity will be. It'll be fun. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then um, after... Um,
after um, we will go into the first group work. And that will be the first time we'll actually work in countries. So we will explain before we go uh, for coffee break what that will be. Okay? So the panel's now straight to audience stays here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, are you coming with us? No, I stay here. You're staying here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're all going to be uploaded onto the site, but I'll send it to you anyway. Hello? Hello?
teacher <laughs> infrastructure and also the learning materials part. And uh, we will be having the presentation and also the sharing from two countries, Nepal and Vietnam. And uh, I will uh, open the floor and uh, be uh, offering and also asking Nepalese colleagues to share first. And we will be having maximum 10 minutes for yeah. the sharing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so a very quick introduction. We have Jaya Chaya from the Ministry of Education looking at the budget planning and programming. So that's a large portfolio. And then we have Ganesh Padiel, who's the head of the inclusive education section of the Department of Education. And then we have Subek Chakaki, who is representing the Association of INGOs, that is our civil society partners that are in our sector wide approach, um, working together with the government and supporting the government. So when we when we were talking in the other room as well about the supply side and we have we have a few comments about the terminology but we will save that for the next section session but when we talked about the input one thing that we want to raise is that before you think about nepal and it's a, a very complex geography and it is very challenging in terms of accessibility as it is uh in any situation is that we are dealing with a dual reality because in nepal it's probably the most earthquake prone location in the world like we we do not say that earthquakes are an if earthquakes are when and the interval between earthquakes is the only thing that that might vary so we have to think in, in inclusive education not just in terms of sector planning but also in terms of disaster in terms of response and recovery and how do children with disabilities are being supported in that and so that is for example where and then I'll hand it over where we also have not just minimum enabling conditions in for inclusive education in regular schools and infrastructure, but also in temporary learning centers that are established after, for example, now after the 2015 earthquake where 9,000 schools were uh, demolished. So, so this is something to keep in mind when, when our colleagues are speaking that they actually do not, do not only plan for regular uh, sector planning, but also always have to think about response and recovery as well. I'll hand it over to Ganeshji for maybe to start off about the provisions and scholarships. Yes, okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. You have already introduced me, me, Ganesh Powdell. I, I work for the Department of Education. Uh, yes, okay, I will highlight it, uh, some uh, policy provision and the uh, program, uh, scholarship. Um, program, but uh, I will uh, let me start from the constitution. We um, uh, got a new constitution uh, three years uh, ago, and uh, that constitution has um, given the big priority for the inclusion. And the the main character of uh, fundamental character of constitution is the inclusion, because if uh, you see the constitution, uh, we can found uh, 35 times. Uh, this word inclusion uh, is written in our constitution. I mean, uh, this is the big uh, priority area. After that, we um, uh, government um, uh, issued uh, inclusive education policy for people with disability. It was the hard discussion during the drafting um, time. Uh, inclusion means uh, for all and how can we address that this is the really different uh, need uh, from other group. Uh, disability area is the um, uh, huge um, <coughs> challenge and the issues. So we have to uh, make justice. Uh, this kind of um, uh, debate was um, uh, there. And, and finally, we make a conclusion. This is OK, inclusive uh, education policy for people with disability. And uh, just we captured the issues uh, related to um, uh, inclusive education policy. And the, yes, definitely uh, in our supply side, um, support side, we discussed very much about the teacher, not only the teacher, we have the, we discussed about the um, um, uh, management team also and the caretaker definitely should be the part of our uh, system and the teacher definitely and the teacher also is divided into the, some uh, they have a responsibility the ritual teacher some is a special teacher and the, some mainstream uh, teacher some uh, uh, initiating teacher yeah, many uh, are responsible uh, likewise and uh, for this um, site uh, 
government develop a minimum enabling condition for the resource uh, classes how we started from there and this is for the um, insurance uh, for, for the quality quality um, about the um, our program i mean uh, for the children with disability and we prepared this one and the, the, under that uh, we uh, put the different kind of provision and the, that is the infrastructure that is the disaster management also and mm -hmm. the teacher preparation and the other uh, many uh, there and the, okay uh, i'm going to highlight a few things about the scholarship yes government of uh, nepal uh, provides uh, scholarship for all 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 means uh, um, for all um, children with disability in public school and the scholarship provide uh, from grade one to higher education and the scholarship is divided into uh, mainly two categories one is the residential facility residential scholarship another non-residential scholarship yeah you know the our um, geographic um, location is so um, um, how to say challenging yes and uh, there is a mountain and the Tara and the hilly area so uh, we provide residential facilities uh, scholarship for those uh, children student who cannot uh, uh, who doesn't have uh, access uh, from their home to school right home school so um, at that condition we are providing the residential scholarship uh, more than eight uh, thousand uh, children uh, getting the, this kind of scholarship other we have um, uh, more than seventy six thousand uh, children with uh, disability in school system, among them uh, 60,000 uh, students are uh, receiving uh, a scholarship. That is all a kind of, I mean, one is the residential and the non-residential scholarship also divided into three categories. One is the technical support scholarship, that is the some children who use uh, devices and uh, he needs, uh, he or she needs uh, a human support also. Uh, that kind of um, children uh, can uh, receive uh, another uh, is the transportation uh, another is the motivational yeah that we have a uh, mainly four category uh, residential one type of and the non-residential three category okay i think that this is the scholarship um Words about the technical, work, technical <coughs> working group and coordination. Yes, okay. I think uh, we will highlight it, the things. And the, we have a very good network with the DPO and the other uh, civil society um, who uh, is working for this area. So I think yeah. Sivit Saji will highlight. Uh, in terms of relation between the civil society, government, and then the development partner, we have a very good co uh, coordination and collaboration between all three members. And then currently we are uh, implementing the school sector development plan eight years from 2016 to 2023. So under this SSTP, we have different thematic working group where the like government is uh, uh, the chair of the thematic group, whereas the co-lead is taken by the development partner and we are civil society as a member organization which we will be providing the like um, technical support uh, in terms of uh, uh, learning materials or teacher training development packages and then equity strategy and all those things. So for children with disabilities, especially we are focused on the, there is a specific uh, group for access, equity and inclusive education. So under that, we, will, uh, we as a development partner under the thematic working group, we are providing the technical support for the effective implementation of SSTP as well as the equity strategy. So I just wanted to highlight that there is a very good coordination among the government stakeholders and all, all the development civil societies in Nepal. Thank you. One minute more. We have to add on anything. One minute. <laughs> just one minute. Yeah. <laughs> then I will answer. Hello, goodbye. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, maybe we can. Maybe Jayati can yeah. respond to some of the questions. Yeah. At the end, so then we can. Yeah, that, that, that's so fine. Very, very okay, so you have just been hearing about uh, from Nepal on the infrastructure part, also on the scholarship and also the coordination amongst government, uh, NGO, DPOs, and also the development partners. Then we will now all be also hearing from Vietnam on uh, teacher training uh, in inclusive and pre-service, um, uh, in-service and pre-service teacher. Training 
training uh, and, and uh, some of the things on the learning materials. And if you want to touch base also on the school infrastructure, you have 10 minutes now. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as you know that uh, yeah, up to now Vietnam has uh, around uh, 1 million and 300 children with disabilities and uh, you know that uh, just only is uh, un from uh, the age of 5 to 16 years old not uh, we don't, uh, don't count for the children with uh, okay <laughs> under 5 years old and as a teacher for general schools, uh, from preschool to uh, grade 12, around uh, 900,000 uh, teachers. And up to now, uh, we have uh, around uh, 16,000 uh, teachers trained in inclusive education. That, um, that, that's some uh, number you can uh, imagine. That's a picture of uh, teacher training in Vietnam. Uh, up to now, we have uh, so uh, I think so diversity of uh, training programs on inclusive education, like uh, pre-service and uh, in-service training. And uh, with uh, in-service training first, you know that uh, we have uh, maybe very short course training in inclusive education <coughs> from two days, three days, five days for teacher. That uh, teacher maybe one year school they can uh, get some training. Uh, uh, short course trainings in inclusive uh, education. That means uh, already teacher. Um, maybe we, uh, and uh, we have other uh, training program on. We call it uh, certificate programs for three months for teachers. They get a certificate that uh, officially they can work in the field of inclusive education. And uh, with uh, other uh, in service uh, training about. Uh, for already teacher, that uh, teacher who has been teaching in uh, schools already, they get other uh, diplomas um, like uh, BA uh, certificate uh, in inclusive education. They can get uh, from uh, two uh, and a half year or three year training programs, and then they uh, get a BA in inclusive education. And with the uh, pre-service training, we have uh, three years training program. Uh, for colleges and four-year training program in university. And uh, up to now, around uh, nearly 3,000 teachers who get uh, BA in uh, uh, inclusive. inclusive education already. And um, Vietnam has been uh, conducting uh, master training programs in inclusive education since 2012, uh, six years uh, near, uh, six years now, around uh, 100 and, uh, um, 140 uh, students in uh, master uh, in inclusive education already. And Vietnam uh, also has been uh, conducting, oh, uh, not has been, but uh, Vietnam starts uh, um, program training, training program in inclusive education at PhD level yeah, in this year. And uh, for the first course of PhD uh, starts uh, in October this year. And uh, you, you know, about the, the learning materials. Yeah, um, about the learning uh, materials, you know that um, uh, with the university or colleges, we uh, can uh, make uh, our materials for training by the by uh, university and colleges. But uh, you know that uh, for a long time, we uh, has been uh, supported by NGO like UNICEF, UNESCO, or other NGOs. Uh, uh, they support us to develop the um, pilot uh, project, and in some pilot projects, uh, we develop the uh, material trainings. And up to now, we have uh, so um, so so. I I, I think that uh, we we can meet the needs of the practice on material. Uh, for different uh, teachers at different schools because uh, all the materials we get from the um, practical by piloting of the project supported by uh, NGO. But uh, material training is uh, still in the progress and uh, we also have to change uh, and adapt uh, some uh, materials from other countries uh, and um, apply it, um, uh, very, uh, I think that is uh, 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 adapt them into Vietnamese context materials now. 
uh, about the support teacher, uh, something support teacher in classroom. We have a policy for the teachers and we have a policy for the children with disabilities. Um, but you know that um, um, we, 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 we cannot, uh, because uh, of the decentralization uh, as a chance of the war and in Vietnam, that means um, provinces that they have their own rights to use the resources from the government from the central government so uh, yeah, some uh, policy is very uh, very well effective in practice but uh, in some provinces but uh, some provinces it's not um, very effectively um, for the policies because of the decentralization and uh, in fact in uh, in fact Infrastructure, infrastructure. You know that um, we um, we have the law on the transportation about uh, about the buildings, the house buildings, uh, all the structures for the uh, accessibility for the uh, person with disabilities. But uh, you know that uh, some 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 sectors uh, do it very well, but some sectors uh, not so well. Uh, so. Um, Please come to Vietnam and see uh, some instructor in Vietnam. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, from what uh, I heard from the two countries, so it is more when we talk about inclusive education, it is uh, from both countries system based rather than the project based. Uh, and and, and uh, we start from the uh, uh, demand uh, things. And from Vietnam, there, uh, there's a big gap between the uh, demand and also with the supply. Uh, there's a huge number of children with disability, whereas the number of teachers trained on inclusive education and special education, despite the various type of training, pre-service, in-service, and uh, that have been done for a long time, but still uh, the big gaps uh, is there. And uh, if Mr. Hu from the Ministry of Education and Training, if you want to add on one or two minutes on the policies on inclusive education uh, um, uh, for children with disability in Vietnam and be helping you to translate what you said in, 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 into English. I'm sorry because um, uh, Mr. Hugh is the uh, general deputy director in charge of the primary education department of the MOET in Vietnam. Uh, he could not speak English, so uh, just uh, bear uh, with him for a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Việt Nam và Bộ Dục Đào Tạo chúng tôi đã có một cái, cái uh, tiền dụng khuẩn nhập từ năm 2006 và vừa rồi thì chúng tôi lại tiếp tục có một cái uh, thông tư của Bộ Dục Đào Tạo để uh, quy định về giáo dục khuyết tật nói chung là trong đó đặc biệt là giáo dục khuẩn nhập. Uh, since the year 2006, the Ministry of Education and Training has issued uh, many kind of the sub-laws, circulars and guidelines guiding the implementation of inclusive education. And very recently, there has been the revision of those sub-laws uh, for inclusive education for children with disability, both in terms of the uh, allowances and remuneration for uh, children with disability and also for teachers. Uh, who are teaching the children with disability in the regular schools? À, Việt Nam chúng tôi là một trong những nước đầu tiên uh, tham gia cái công ước quốc tế về quyền người khuyết tật và năm 2015 thì chúng tôi đã uh, quốc hội à, mừng bốn chúng tôi đã quốc hội chúng tôi đã phê chuẩn cái uh, uh, công ước này thực hiện công ước này và chính vì thế mà chúng tôi đã có một ủy ban quốc gia về người khuyết tật à, đây cũng chính là một cái hành lang pháp lý một cái tổ chức uh, uh, chỉ đạo uh, lãnh đạo của uh, chính phủ để chúng tôi có thể uh, tạo điều kiện để thực hiện tốt cái giáo dục uh, khuyết tật này. And, uh, following the ratification of the uh, CRPD uh, in in uh, Vietnam since the, uh, the the year 2016, then there has been also lots of momentum and progress within the uh, the country in terms of driving forward the DBT issues and within Vietnam we have the national committee uh, on coordination of disability and that is led by the deputy prime minister of uh, the government and also with the uh, uh, coordination role lies with the ministry of uh, labor invalids and social affairs with also all the line um, uh, ministries. Uh, 
và cái giáo dục khuyết tật của chúng tôi thì cùng với cái giáo dục đặc biệt giáo dục chuyên biệt thì chúng tôi có cái giáo dục hòa nhập thì có thể nói rằng là chúng tôi có khá đầy đủ các chính sách có thể nói là khá hoàn thiện đấy cho nên hiện nay chúng tôi là trong cái đề án của chính phủ 1019 ý, là phấn đấu đến năm 2020 thì 7% học sinh khuyết tật được tiếp cận giáo dục 7% và 50% cán bộ quản lý và giáo viên là được tập huấn đào tạo bồi dưỡng về giáo dục hòa nhập và các trường của chúng tôi thì từ cơ sở vật chất cho đến đội ngũ giáo viên thì chúng tôi đều có cái quan tâm đến cái điều kiện đảm bảo và các trường đặc biệt là trường chuẩn quốc gia chúng tôi đều có một cái yêu cầu là cơ sở vật chất để cho người khuyết tật được tiếp cận And uh, also we have the school uh, minimum standard, just like with uh, Nepal, asking all the school to provide the enabling environment in terms of the uh, infrastructure, accessibility, uh, uh, accessibility for children with disability. And also we have the national action plan on education for children with disability. And, and the target is that by the year 2020, Uh, there will be 70% of children with disability in Vietnam having access to education, either through special education or inclusive education. And also 50% of the teachers who are working with children with disability will be trained. Và chúng tôi đều có cái chế độ cho người dạy cũng như người học. Đối với giáo viên chúng tôi thì là một tiết dạy của giáo viên ý, đối với giáo dục hòa nhập thì được nhân với 0,2 uh, so với lại cái uh, quy định của, của, của uh, cái tiết dạy của lương giáo viên. Đối với học sinh thì các học sinh đi học thì chúng tôi được miễn phí đối với học sinh khuyết tật và đặc biệt những học sinh nghèo và cận nghèo thì được học bổng. Với cơ sở giáo dục thì chúng tôi hỗ trợ cơ sở giáo dục về cái kinh phí để mua sắm trang thiết bị đặc thù phục vụ cho giáo dục khuyết tật. So we also have uh, policies in terms of incentive for teachers in the regular school uh, teaching children with disability and we also supporting the children with disability within the school. We have the abolition of school fee uh, for children with disability who are from the poor families and, 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 and those uh, uh, policies within Vietnam. Uh, however, in terms of the enforcement of those policy in reality is still weak. Yeah. So I, I, I think that uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Hiu, for, for him having shared that. Now we have only five minutes left for all the audience to raise any questions or concerns. Yeah, I saw the first hand here, please. Yeah, yeah. And, and then over to you. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> I have three questions, but I will be fast as much as possible. Uh, the first one is I heard very good experience from both Vietnam and uh, Naples. Uh, regarding teachers training but my worry is that in my country yes special education teachers will be assigned as much as possible in irregular schools to support um, regular teachers but my question is what about the content of their training the quality of their training usually in my country the training um, of such teachers focuses only on theoretical perspective uh, of the discipline that uh, forget adaptive skills like sign language, um, braille literacy, daily living skills, and so on and so, on and so forth. So in my country, a deaf child may, may, may be uh, placed in regular schools without having you know, sign language interpretation. So this is, for me, exclusion, not ex uh, inclusion. This is directly related to the type um, and the process of teachers uh, Uh, training in my country. So please share me your experience regarding the quality and content of the uh, curriculum of teachers training that uh, 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 focuses on uh, training of special needs education teachers. The second question is, uh, yes, you, you have said that you have provisions uh, in your um, uh, infrastructure proclamations that promotes um, accessibility. But my question is, the same is true in my country. We have provisions in the construction policy, building code, and so on and so on. But the problem is inconsistency of the implementation because there is no accountability and there is no responsible body in my country to uh, monitor whether the, these policies and the legal frameworks are implemented you know, uh, properly. So what about accountability and monitoring of the implementation of these laws? And the, the last question is, um, yes, you have said that uh, in a regular school system, uh, ch ch children with disabilities should get adaptive uh, materials, educational materials, and adaptive technology too. 
who is responsible to supply those materials? In my country, there is a confusion. It is considered as a, a, you know, a donation to be granted by NGOs. Thank you. So uh, three questions and, and one more from Andrea. Yeah, and, and then we will be, and you, okay. Just one question, but first a comment. I want to congratulate Vietnam around what I have shared around the pre-service training of teachers, because I think that is where inclusive education start. Um, maybe just on that, I want to know how much time, and I think it links to the previous questions and the content is spent in pre-service training for um, teachers on inclusion and inclusion, uh, inclusive pedagogies and all of those as part of the complete training in pre-service. And forgive me if I could add on to that because I've been researching both your countries. Um, I know we've talked about a lack of uh, implementation whenever these laws are happening, but also about a lack of awareness for the families not knowing that they're entitled to free education. If you could speak of any movement on that front. Thank you. Um, actually, I don't have a question for Nepal and Vietnam. But it's as far as it's a part of this morning presentation from DFID. I have just one question for uh, DFID and UNICEF. Is there, is, are they have a, like a, a joint planning to address children with disability issue? Uh, if this is yes, then how also they are reaching the participation of or the involvement of DPOs? Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks for all the questions. So uh, questions on quality of pre-service teacher training, questions on accountability and also monitoring and enforcement of the laws and policies, and questions around adaptive materials and um, uh, curricula. So uh, who, who wants to, to answer first? Well, Nepal, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and also uh, awareness. I could, uh, give, a, I could yeah. give a one sentence answer to yeah. the last question. So in terms of coordination, in terms of joint planning, in country, in the case of Nepal, we have a sector-wide approach. That means that we, as eight partners, so UNICEF is there, DIFID is there, World Bank is there, Asian Development Bank and others, we all plan jointly and we review jointly with the government against the government's plan. So in that case, we make sure that any of our in inclusive education programs and uh, and support is aligned with what what we have uh, what is written in the education sector plan so in that sense all of that is joint planned we don't have separate projects on that mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah they are part of that so as we have a joint review and a joint planning mechanism where we we meet on a regular basis with the government to jointly review and plan <coughs> against you know uh, for our annual plans against the education sector plan. Sorry, I, I have to hand it over. <laughs> okay, thank you for the very genuine queries. Uh, regarding the teacher training, you know, our colleagues have mm. already shared this. In Nepalese context, we have teacher competency framework. There are seven broader competencies. So teachers should have these competencies. And we are in the phase of elaborating more, elaborating the competencies. Based on those competencies, we prepare teacher training curriculum and provide training to the teachers. So uh, there is a mechanism for quality assurance as well. That is uh, first practice uh, in place in Nepal. Then another one is, you know, as our, our colleagues from Ethiopia told, uh, legally uh, the disability people are uh, people with disability are being excluded. But in Nepalese context, we have reservation in Teacher Education Act as well. You know, for the certain quotas of the teachers should be uh, for the people with disability and they can appoint in the school. It is the very good uh, exercise we claim. And then regarding the monitoring, yes, of course, uh, we have the image system, certain 
information we captured from the EMIS. And periodically, we organize workshops, meetings. Uh, we capture some information over there. Then uh, we have also monitoring mechanism to monitor activities. Then regarding the allocation of budget, of course, there are sort of four major uh, criteria uh, to develop the plan. One of the criteria is one of the criteria is whether the program and uh, project is supported to the disability or not. So it's one of the best practices. Thank you. Okay, uh, given time uh, constraint, um, uh, I suggest that uh, uh, there's one question on also on the content of the teacher training, pre-service tra teacher training. Then we will be uh, ha having the uh, side uh, this discussion for following this one. And I may I invite Vietnam team very quickly sure. touch base on uh, monitoring uh, okay. accountability and also the okay. uh, awareness part. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> 30 seconds. Uh, related about the uh, monitoring system in my country, um, as I mentioned, um, Dr. Uh, Hugh said that the, um, um, we have the National Council on Disability with a central level, uh, with a multi stakeholder uh, in that uh, level. Um, in provincials, uh, too, we have provincial uh, council on disability. So every six months, we have to report. Uh, indicator related about uh, something related about the healthcare, something about the um, education, um, everything that related about the, um, the indicator that uh, we report uh, directly to the prime minister. And um, we have some responsibility about that indicator uh, every six months um, related about the um, raising awareness uh, of the parent of children with disabilities. Uh, this year, the, um, the side from the uh, uh, CSO um, and DPO, um, they always have the um, responsibility to talk with the parent uh, about the children with disability, the, about the in, uh, importance of the inclusive education for children with disability. And of course, uh, we uh, have the good relationship with the um, teacher in school. Um, they have um, days by day uh, meeting with parents about the uh, parent uh, group meeting uh, every month. Uh, so based on that, we're raising awareness of the parent uh, of the children with disability uh, uh, to bring their uh, child to school. Uh, if a child with a very severe, um, they need um, assistance. So that's why uh, some um, teachers, they have to go to home. Uh, that's a kind of home by train uh, for the uh, children with disability, especially in the rural area. That's a key point. Thank you. Okay. Still one more burning, burning yes. one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Grace. 